right. um, welcome back to the last talk of this session. Please take your seats. So, um, yeah, the last speaker of the session is uh, Andreas Blum, who's going to talk about Hamiltonian property testing. So, Andreas, please, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, well, this is joint work, as you can see, with uh, Matthias, who has uh, indirectly featured already several times in the session. He's sitting somewhere in the back with a mask, so you might not recognize him. And uh, with Adil Ufkir, who could unfortunately not make it, but who's the guy who actually did the work. So if you're un unhappy with my pre uh, presentation, if you have questions, just write an email to Adil. He can probably answer better than I can. Anyway, so what are we trying to do? Well, we're in a similar setting as the talks before. I guess this is why we're in the same session. Um, so we all know that quantum systems are governed by the Hamiltonians. This is why we care about them. And uh, as Tim, for example, presented, sometimes we want to learn them from access to the time evolution. So this is actually borrowed from Tim's talk. So usually you have a preparation. Um, you have a quantum system that you want to learn. You have kind of controls time evolution, but just switching it on and off at a convenient time. And in the end, you measure something. But what happens if we actually don't want to learn the quantum system? Maybe this is too much. We care only about like one single property, for example, whether the system is local or not. Of course, if we could learn it first, then we could look at it and say, look, I mean, it's, it's local or it isn't. Um, but maybe that's, it's, it's easier if you just want to know this property. So the question is, is this an easier problem or not? And um, well, this talk will give the answer to that in some sense. So what's our setup? So um, we want to consider a system of n qubits. So that's dimension two to the n. So far, so good. And since we're talking about qubits, it will be very convenient to do the standard thing, namely to take the Hamiltonian and to always write it down as an expansion in terms of Pauli strings. So these p's here are just strings of Pauli's where each entry is like either identity x, y, or z. Uh, so from the set here. And these coefficients alpha p are just numbers. They're real numbers. And this is what you would, for example, uh, like to learn if you do learning. So if you do learning, for example, you would want your algorithm to output an estimator h hat or alpha hat, depending on how you do this, uh, such that some norm that you have chosen, I mean, this is your figure of merit, this comes with the problem, um, that the distance of the estimator to the actual Hamiltonian is at most epsilon with probability, say, at least one, uh, two thirds, right? So this is the standard learning. This is not what we're doing. And often a learning algorithm would assume to begin with, for example, that the Hamiltonian they want to learn is local. And then you can so, uh, show that then it's like an efficient algorithm. That's like a very standard assumption. But we basically, at the beginning of this project, we thought to ourselves, well, how do people know, right? I mean, how, how do you know that you're local and can actually do this? So this is basically where we come in. So what do we want to do? Well, first we have to talk about locality. So I think like depending on the community, like sometimes this is also called k bodiness. So like k local for us means that basically all the coefficients alpha p here are zero um, that for the p's the fed weight at least k. So that means that um, there's at least k uh, like more than k factors or entries that are not the identity. Just to check, uh, for example, if you look at x i i x, this is too local because there's two things that are not the identity. And x, y, z, x would be four local because there's four things that are not the identity, right? Good. So what's this, the problem that we want to solve? That's the following. So you're given a locality parameter k. So that's your locality. You're given a norm, anything, and an accuracy parameter epsilon between 0 and 1. Such that, uh, And then the Hamiltonian k locality testing problem that we write like this. So like if the norm, if the epsilon is the following task. So you're given access to the time evolution according to an unknown Hamiltonian age, as in learning. And you want to decide with success probability at least two thirds, whether one of the two following things is true, whether either age is k local or whether age is epsilon far from being k local in the norm that comes with the problem. So meaning that the difference to any k local Hamiltonian in this norm is at least epsilon. And if, of course, like it could be that H satisfies neither one or two, and then you don't care, like any output is fine. So like in, if you're like a computer scientist, this is a promise problem. You sort of promised that one of the two things is, is true. And if the promise doesn't hold, then whatever. 
So, of course, like instead of two thirds, I could just put any number that is larger than one half, as least as it's constant, that doesn't really matter. Uh, it's just for concreteness. Right. So we know what the problem is. So now I have to tell you what we are allowed to do to solve it. And you could think about different settings. So for example, you could talk about these kind of strategies. So like each blue box is like one time you sort of like run a sub step of the algorithm. And what you do is you prepare the state on a potentially larger system. So there might be ancillary qubits around. Then you run the time evolution, which is this uh, red box there um, on like the n qubits. Then you measure on everything you have, and then you record the outcome. And you out use the outcome in two ways. So you once you put the outcome to the algorithm that in the end will tell you whether either yes or no, you're local. And you can use it for the next round, right? I mean, so you can, for example, base your preparation and your measurements now on the outcome of the previous thing. And you can do this like for any for any of the previous outcomes. So this is why it's an, an incoherent um, strategy because it always measures at the end of each step. And it's adaptive potentially, like if you use all the outcomes here. Contrary to that, we could look at coherent strategies. So that's um, that's a bit different. So there you just prepare one state. And again, like on potentially like uh, an ancilla system. And you run the, the time evolution. And then you can use arbitrary quantum channels in between. Like these NIs are just like quantum channels. And then you, you run the time evolution again, you channel again, and in the end you measure. Right? So like this is more powerful than that. Because like, for example, you could use this ancilla system to just record your classical outcomes and then base your decisions on them. Right. So um, now we come to our first result. We have now set the stage for what we want actually can do. And the first result is that actually this is not easy. Like depending on what your norm is, this might be hard. So if you take k at most uh, order n and you take any ancilla free, meaning that you, you do not have an ancilla, incoherent adaptive quantum algorithm. So that was like the algorithm on the left, but without ancillas. Uh, that solves the k locality testing problem, even if you additionally guarantee that the unknown Hamiltonian is trace free and that it is normalized to have operator norm at most one. Even then, um, this algorithm has to make at least two to the n queries to the unknown Hamiltonian and it has to use an expected total time evolution of two to the n divided by epsilon, meaning that you cannot actually do this, right? With an incoherent, maybe adaptive uh, algorithm that is ancilla free, solving this problem in the infinity norm. Um, so like this, the, no, the norm that we approximate in is not really feasible. Now you can ask, okay, like what about coherent algorithm? I mean, they are more, more powerful, maybe with coherence. I mean, we're all doing quantum information. Coherence is great. This will so, surely work, uh, but that's not true. So like even any coherent quantum algorithm achieving the same has to make at least two to the two, uh, two to the n half many queries and it has to use a total evolution time of at least two to the square root of n, I don't know, two to the n half divided by epsilon. So this is a bit better, but not much. So this is not what you want. Uh, so like, and also like this result actually, because the, the shut norm is basically the best case that rules out testing in any P norm. And that's, that's not something that you want. So now you can ask yourself, like, I mean, why am I even talking to you? I mean, if this is basically the end of the story, I mean, that's not very impressive. Um, but, uh, well, at least the proof is interesting and we will come to more positive uh, things later on. So the proof goes as following. So you want to identify a distinguishing problem that is uh, that a successfully local tester must be able to solve. And the way you do it is um, you construct a promise problem again in a random way. So like either the Hamiltonian is zero or the Hamiltonian has like some hard random unitary and you have to subtract the identity over D to make it trace free <coughs> and just scale it by epsilon to make things like close together. And if you do this, then you can use like a concentration of measure argument for the Haar measure uh, to show that in the case two here, epsilon is far from K local. So, I mean, of course, like if H is zero, then it's very, very local because it doesn't have any terms basically. And the other one's far from, from being K local. So that's good. So that, that like a, a, a successful a uh, tester has to has to, uh, has to distinguish. And then we can use like standard stuff, little camps method to argue that the outcome distributions in the two cases also have to 
have a total variation distance, then you can substitute the total variation distance using Pinsker's inequality by Kullback light by divergence because that's that's nicer to work with in this case. And then you have to, to sort of bound that. And you can use this like using Taylor expansion, Weingarten calculus, and, and all of that. So this is the main work that goes into this once you have the idea how to do it in the first place. Right. As I said, let's now come to more positive results. So like we have so seen shut and p norms are bad. So, so wait, yes. So what's the point where so you're claiming that the distribution you get from this autonomy, zero autonomy Yes. Yeah, that's exactly that. I mean, like sort of the all the Hamiltonians have like very, look very similar in their distributions. That's why you cannot really distinguish them. So, like, if, if you could, if you could distinguish them, then you also had to would need to distinguish this uh, these probability distributions, which is difficult. That's that's the so idea. In what distribution are you looking at? Um, basically, the the distribution of um, the outcomes, right? So, like, if you look at the outcomes here for arbitrary channels. And in this in this setting here, so I mean, there's no channels here, right? I mean, it's just like if you can, if you choose some measurements and you choose some some state preparations which are not specified, uh, then you look at the outcomes and, and a tester for this problem then would have this distribution, right? Thanks. Good. Um, so as I said, like sh testing Schatten p norms is uh, is not good, but uh, it's hard. But we can choose a different norm, and we will choose a slightly unusual one, which is the normalized Frobenius norm. So like you take the Schatten 2 norm, you, but you divide by one over a square root of dimension. So where the Frobenius norm is defined in the usual sense. And then actually um, we can think about what this means. And if you think a bit more about this, then you will find that this norm, especially the average case setting, whereas the operator norm corresponds to the worst case. So we have chances of uh, that this actually works better. And this is the case. So again, if you take k at most uh, linear, then if you again promise that the unknown Hamiltonian is trace free and is norm at most one, then there is an ancilla free incoherent non-adaptive quantum algorithm. So like as, po as easy as possible, you don't have to do anything fancy. Uh, that solves the Hamiltonian k localities testing problem. And it only needs epsilon to the minus four many qu queries in the unknown Hamiltonian. So this is not a type where there's no n, there's no size dependence here. And it also needs a total evolution time of only like epsilon to the minus three. So this is likewise size independent. What is not size independent is the classical post-processing time that you need in the end, which is n to the k plus three divided by epsilon to the four. So this is where the size matters, but it's still polynomial in n. So this is something you can actually do. And it's only the like classical post-processing time, right? So classical computers are easier than quantum stuff. And which is also nice, the testing algorithm also only uses stabilizer states as inputs and stabilizer basis measurements as measurements. So this is also easy for the quantum computer to do. So what, what does this algorithm look like? Well, so first we have to construct the states and measurements that we want to do. And you just take D plus one stabilizer basis from maximally abelian subgroups of the Pauli group. So this is like, for example, how you construct like MU a mutually unbiased basis of stabilizer states. So this, this is fairly well known. And what interests us is not so much like applications and error correction, but like that a quantum computer can prepare and measure them efficiently. So that's, that's why we like them. And then the algorithm is the following. So first you choose two indices i and j, uh, uniformly at random and prepare the corresponding state phi ij. Then you let the whole thing evolve under the unknown Hamiltonian for time t of order epsilon. And you perform a measurement in the same basis that you chose the, the state from and observe an outcome L. And then you have to repeat this procedure n times. And now comes the, the sort of the important step. So now you look at all the L's that you recorded in stage three, right? And at least if at least one of them is such that if you look at the state where you started from and you look at the state where you measured, and sort of the transition from the start to the end cannot be explained by any k local Pauli string, then something non-local has happened and you conclude that you are epsilon far from k local. That's the, that's the thing because like this thing can either be zero or one. And otherwise, like if this can be explained by local stuff, then we claim that the Hamiltonian is H local because we have tried this often enough that and we haven't seen any non-locality, so it's probably non not non-local. Right, so that's the, that's the algorithm, and then you have to prove that it works. And 
So like the, this, the checks in the last steps of these things are, are where the classical uh, overhead comes from. Right. So let's, let, for the proof idea, let's just take a, a sketch like for a simplified thing. So for example, we only um, assume that now we have only I or X, so like that's the commuting Hamiltonian. And for this kind of thing, we can make our life a bit easier. This is just like, I mean, the proof is actually more complicated. This is just like for, for the purpose of this presentation. So if you take zero as the input state in a computational basis measurement, so we don't have to use this full algorithm. And then we notice that if you look at a string of axes where J is a vector, then you can prepare like state J by just applying X to zero. And if you have short time, then you can approximate the exponential by a linear uh, term. So if you do that, then for example, if you look at a, a, any n-bit string J with weight, with positive weight, then it holds that the transition matrix squared is basically of order like T squared times the coefficient. And now if you assume that H is indeed K local, then all of the, the alphas are zero with too large weight. And now you can think about these things. So the probability of measuring anything that is high weight, right? I mean, I only look at the high weight things. Since these things are zero, those things will be zero. So like the whole thing is, uh, is about zero. So like you don't make an error here. So like if you have, if you're in the K local case, you will never see anything that will tell you you're not local. That's good. And conversely, if H is epsilon far from any such local Hamiltonian, then you can, by the choice of the norm, the sum of the coefficients squared will basically be larger or equal than epsilon squared, meaning that the whole thing, like the whole probability of seeing an outcome that tells you that you're not local is of order t squared epsilon squared. And then you only have to choose the t accordingly that this becomes constant. So like um, you have to repeat uh, this whole thing, like t to the minus two epsilon to the minus two times to make it constant. The t has to be small for, for this approximation to make sense. And this is what gives you what I, what I showed you in the, in the beginning. Great. And to make the proof size, we have to deal with higher order terms and non-commutative stuff and so on. So this brings us to the last result. So the last result that I um, that I have is now you could say, for example, I mean we're still trying to use to solve the question: Is learning actually harder or not than uh, than testing? Right. So it could be that for this strange norm, learning is also easy, but this turns out not to be the case because any even coherent quantum algorithm with a constant number of uh, ancilla qubits or auxiliary qubits, when given evolution access to an arbitrary and qubit Hamiltonian H, which fulfills like trace free and, and norm bounded, um, that succeeds with success probability two thirds and outputs a classical description H hat such that you are close in normalized two distance. So any algorithm that actually solves the learning problem that has to make at least two to the two and many queries to H and if you restrict yourself to non-adaptive incoherent quantum algorithms, you get like two to the two n divided by epsilon. So this seems says that learning in some sense is still hard for this problem. If you don't make like the locality <laughs> assumption, right? The, the, the point is that this learner has to not use the fact that it's, that it's looking at a K local model because you don't know that, right? And um, I think in the interest of time, let me shorten the proof idea a bit. So basically, um, the idea is the same. You want to identify a distinguishing problem that a, use, a successful general Hamiltonian learner can solve. You do it in a, in a probabilistic way by taking unitary CUX that you apply to a fixed operator that is like half plus one and half minus one, such as trace zero. Um, and you also take them to be how random use concentration of measure to have a lot of, a lot of uh, Hamiltonians that look the same. So the, you can construct a family which is well together. And then you can use, uh, for example, Farnus inequality that will tell you that the mutual information between the, the label of the Hamiltonian you're looking at and the thing that the learner guessed, that this has to be, hard, has to be big because this family was double exponentially big. So this is still exponential. And then basically you, you, have, to, uh, you have to bound this mutual information from above in terms of the, the dimension of the systems involved. Yeah, so let's, let's skip the rest. And um, so what I, what I didn't tell you, I mean, I only told you about locality, but actually we can do a lot more. So um, we can actually also test any other property, meaning that it's a, some subset of Pauli strings um, that we fix. So we can either test whether you are in the set, for example, the, the low weight ones, this would be locality, or epsilon far from it. 
So it doesn't really matter which strings you take. Um, and the, the result is the same, just believe me. And uh, for example, for locality, this, the set would be fairly small. So like in the end, you just replace, like, you now have like just the size of the set appearing, for example, in the classical post-processing time, all the rest is really the same. And uh, well, if, if, the, if the property S is too large, you can do ancillary qubits and then everything still works. That's maybe not so important. Uh, results that didn't make it into this talk at all, it's just that you can also test in parallel, then get in log M overhead, like with classical shadows. And we can also do tolerant property testing where you're not saying that you have to be K local or far from it, but you have to be cl close to K local or far from it. So that's, that still works. So if you now are fascinated by this topic and you want to work on this as well, then here's some open questions for you. Um, first things, are our bounds optimal? We don't know. Is this, for example, is the scaling of epsilon to the minus four necessary or can you do better? Can you maybe do like epsilon to the minus two, epsilon to the minus one? We don't know. Um, for example, yeah, I mean, can you achieve Heisenberg scaling? I try other distance measures such as Wasserstein distances because they are sort of more adaptive to many body stuff. And you could ask about other access models, uh, for example, locality testing from Gibbs states. And this is actually what we are currently thinking about, but we don't know yet. And yeah, since Daniel likes Lindblad generators, you could try to do this for Lindblad generators, but we have absolutely no idea how to do it yet. Good, that's it. So that was the, the summary was, we talked about locality testing, we wanted to know whether Hamiltonian is K local or epsilon far from it. And we found a setting in which learning is hard, but uh, for testing, we can actually give an efficient algorithm. And if you want to know more about this, look at this paper. Thanks. Thanks, Andreas, for the nice talk and for tailoring the open questions to my taste. Uh, are there any other? Uh, yeah, I guess. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you for the nice talk. Um, Please skip that. The, the first uh, question is, in the no result that you have for, with respect to the operator norm mm -hmm. for coherent measurement, mm -hmm. you, you are assuming an ancilla free setting, right? Um, I don't think so. I think this this one is actually this one does not have to be ancilla free, if I remember correctly. Okay, so this implies that uh, testing uh, a local Hamiltonians with respect to operator norm is uh, art. Yes. Okay, I see. Uh, okay, thank you. And the uh, second question is that um, okay, um, 